All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, a couple things that we want to talk about first. We've talked about um, pressure canning already in this webinar series, but for those of you that are new to this or are, um, haven't been to our other webinars, we want to do a quick review over um, how we can different kinds of foods and why it matters. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about high acid and low acid foods, but they will get different ways of processing. Uh, it just depends on the content of the acid and the different pathogens that can grow in the foods that we change how we do um, our canning. So there's two ways that we process foods to prepare them for shelf, uh, to be shelf stable. One is with a water bath canner. We're gonna go into detail today about how to do that and, and um, process foods with water bath. And this is only for high acid foods. So things like fruits and pickles, those are high acid foods and they would use a water bath canner. Low acid foods like meats and vegetables need to be canned under pressure. And the main reason for this is because of the heat level, right? Some pathogens we can kill at um, boiling temperature, which in Utah is 202 degrees. Yep, it gets most of those molds and other bacteria that can start to degrade food. However, there is a pathogen that we are worried about, which is called botulism, that is um, that can grow very well in low acid foods and it needs to be um, canned in a pressure canner because the pressure canner can get up to 240 degrees. So that's the biggest difference is the heat that these two different kinds of processing can provide. Um, and it changes how, depending on the food that we are using. Uh, a couple of things to note, when we are canning fruits, we want to um, pick fruits at their peak quality. All right, so six to 12 hours after being picked, we want to start canning them. We want to wait till they are just ripe, and then can them as quickly as possible in order to maintain that peak um, freshness of that food. One thing that some people don't understand is that the quality we can with, so the quality we put in our jars is the quality we're going to get out of those jars, right? Later on when we want to eat that food. If you're putting in poor quality or foods and fruits that haven't, um, that have had a little time to like, degrade or, um, get old, they aren't going to be very good when you take them out of the jar later on, all right? So just know that we want to do it at its peak freshness. It's really good to allow apricots, peaches, pears, and plums to ripen one or more days before between harvest and canning, but that would be the only exception on those. Uh, if you do have some fresh fruit that you can't get canned right away, you can put them in the refrigerator until you are ready. But the best practice is don't pick them until you're ready to can them and then get it done. <laughs> okay, all right, so let's talk a little bit about high acid versus low acid pH. When we're talking about pH, we're talking about um, the way we measure acid in foods. And we have a scale that goes all the way from one to 14. Um, the pH, when it's lower, it means there's more acid in that food. It's an inverse relationship. So as one goes up, the other goes down. Uh, so high acid foods are going to have a low pH. So if we have a pH of three, that's a low pH. We know it's a high acid food. It is probably a fruit. Seven is neutral. And that is what our bodies sit at, is at that neutral seven-ish, 7.6. And then as we climb into the eights through 14s, we're getting into our base or alkaline. If you've ever tasted soap or something that's bitter, that is a food that has more alkaline or base in it, and it has a lower or higher pH, a lower acid level. Okay, so I know it can be a little bit confusing when we're talking about it, um, but just think more acid, lower pH. Okay, because that's really what we're kind of talking about today because we're focusing a lot on fruits is that um, the more acid it has, the lower the pH. And if you look at this scale, we're looking from the three pH of three to a pH of 4.6. That is where most of our fruits sit. Okay, can you see that? Um, all those berries, our peaches, our apricots, our apples, pears. We do have one fruit that sits kind of close to that um, 
4.6 line and that is tomato. So those ones we do treat differently because they are not quite as acidic as they used to be. And so we need to add acid to those when we can them, but they can still be done in a water bath canner if we've added that acid. Um, other fruits though, they already have enough acid, can't grow botulism in that environment. And so they're safe to do in a water bath canner. If you have anything else though, that has a pH of 4.6 to seven, it needs to be done in a pressure canner. So that would include all our vegetables and our meats. I'm excited to be here to do the uh, demo for tonight's class. Um, I'm gonna be doing an apple pie filling. Um, and so I got my recipe from the ball canning book. Um, it's a basic recipe um, that we'll be using tonight and we'll be going through the steps of it. I've prepared um, most of it, but we'll still go through the steps. I just prepared it ahead of time so you don't have to watch me go through the whole canning process. Um, so when you're picking a, a recipe, you wanna make sure, and April might talk about this more, um, in her lecture part of it, but you wanna make sure you pick a reliable recipe. Um, and the ball canning books are great places to look for a recipe. And so that's, like I said, that's where I picked mine. Um, and once you pick a recipe, you wanna follow it exactly. You don't wanna change any of the measurements or anything like that because it's been tested for safety and reliability. So we're just gonna go step through step through this recipe, I'll kind of, uh, describe what I'm doing as we go through it. But first things first, before we start the, the prepping of the food, we're going to prepare the canner. So I've already prepared the jars. They're um, heating up or they're hot right now and I've washed them and everything. So they're good to go. Really quick, I will take you and we'll just look at the water bath canner. Okay, so here we have our water bath canner. So a couple of things when we're using this, um, we want to make sure we fill it up quite a bit of the way. So you can kind of see the top of the line is right here. Um, and that's because we want to make sure that the jars that we're using are covered with the water by uh, one to two inches um, because the water is what is heating up the food in the jar. Um, and so that's why we're doing that. So I've put the water in, I've started to heat it up a little bit. And once we've finished our preparing our jars, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about the water canning, um, water bath canning process. So we're gonna, I'm gonna turn off my video for just a second. So um, first things first, we gotta prepare the apples. Whoa. So like I said, I've cut most of the apples, but, um, We'll prepare at least one of the apples right now. Um, so with this, we want to make sure that we, like I said, we're following the recipe. And this recipe calls for 12 cups of apples. Um, and about three to four pounds is about 12, or um, about four pounds is about 12 cups of apples. So um, if you get them from a tree or whatever, that can kind of give you an idea of how many um, pounds of apples you'll need for at least one um, recipe of the apple pie filling. Um, and then, so we're gonna cut up the apple first and I have this nice little um, apple slicer. So we'll just put it on, I'll move this over a little bit, on the apple slicer. And then this is a really nice tool. Many of you might already have it. Um, but it peels it and cuts it for you. So we'll just start that process and then you'll start to see it peel the apple. Oh, there we go. All right, it's kind of peeling it sort of. <laughs> um, and I have already washed these apples. So I washed the apple and then we're gonna peel it. It's doing a pretty good job. This apple's a little bit weird, but okay. There we go. So we've got a nice almost peeled apple um, and then it's cut as well. So I'm going to just cut this in half um, because we're making that apple pie filling. Um, this 
tool is super nice because it cuts the apple slices into pretty even pieces. So if you don't have one of these tools, you do want to keep take that into consideration that you want the apple slices to be similar in size. So that was a smaller apple and it gives us almost a cup um, of apples. Um, like I said, I already have all of the, the 12 cups of apples ready to go. So we'll just work with about a cup of apples. Um, so we'll put it in our bowl. If you have a lot of apples and that you're cutting and chopping, one thing you can do is have a big bowl of water and put some lemon juice in and have apple slices soaking in that while you're finishing cutting up the rest of the apples and that'll prevent the browning of the apples. Okay, so next up, we're gonna blanch these apples. So I'm gonna turn off my video for a second while we head over to the stove. Just don't want you guys to get uh, motion sick as we move, so. Okay, all right, so I've got my boiling water right here. And then I've got my slotted spoon. So we're going to put the apples into the boiling water. And if you're doing the whole recipe, it recommends that you do work with about six cups at a time. So you'd have a much larger part, pot that you'll be using, um, probably one more the size of this silver pot. Um, and when you blanch the apples, you'll blanch them for um, one minute. So I'm going to set my timer. And we'll just let these blanch for one minute so we don't have to cook them too long. Um, but yeah, you'll have your water boiling. You'll put about six cups of apples into your larger pot of boiling water. Um, and then you'll let them boil for one minute, just blanching them. Um, so you don't want to cook them too much, um, just enough to get them blanched. So we'll give it a couple more seconds. And then after that, once they're blanched, I'll take them out and put them in a, um, a pot and we'll just keep them warm. Um, because at this point, we're going to make the apple pie um, filling part of it. So um, we want to put the, the apples in a pot or in a bowl to keep them warm. Okay, so it's been one minute. They have been properly blanched. So we'll just use a slotted spoon, let them um, drain for a second, and then put them into, okay. So I'll show you the blanched apples really quick before we move on, just so you can see that. I'm gonna turn off my burner, move that out of the way. All right, so I've been keeping it in a nice bowl covered in aluminum foil to keep them warm. Um, and this is just what they look like. So they've been blanched and they're ready to go in our apple pie filling. All right, so next up, we're gonna make our um, actual filling part of it. Um, so I'll be using this bigger pot um, so we can put everything in here, including the apples. So first things first are the ingredients. So we're gonna put in um, sugar, cinnamon, nutmeg, water, and apple juice, and then clear gel, which I'll explain in a second. And I've pre-measured these ingredients. Um, so first things first is sugar. It's two and three fourths cup of sugar. So that's why this recipe tastes so good. <laughs> Lots of sugar. Okay, and then our cinnamon, um, we're gonna have one and a half teaspoons of cinnamon. So we'll get that in here. There's one teaspoon and a half. And then we want a half a teaspoon of nutmeg, of ground nutmeg. I can open it. All right. So it gives us some good flavoring for this apple pie filling. Um, and then we want our water and it calls for cold water. And we want one and one fourth cups of cold water, which I'll pour in there. And then 
unsweetened apple juice, two and a half cups of unsweetened apple juice. And then let's see if I got everything. And then the last thing is the clear gel. So this is what it looks like if you haven't worked with clear gel before. Um, so you can see on the bag, it says modified food starch and it's for canning. Um, and we need three fourths cup of that. So the reason we wanna use the modified food starch is um, it is not recommended to use regular starch, corn starch or other thickeners for canning um, because those types of thickeners um, will affect the um, heat, the ability of the heat to heat through the whole, the food in the jar. <laughs> that makes sense. So um, starch interferes with the transferring of the heat through the food. And the goal of canning is to heat your food all the way through to kill all of that bacteria. And if you're using regular thickeners, um, you might not, it might not happen. So this uh, starch has been modified and it's safe for canning. Okay, so we've got all of our ingredients in the pot. And so I'm gonna bring this to a boil over medium high heat. I'll be stirring it constantly. Um, and then once it starts to thicken and bubble, I'll add in some lemon juice, uh, boil it for one more minute, and then, um, and then we'll add in the apples. So I'll turn it back over to April while this is heating up and thickening, and then we'll show you what it looks like once um, it's been thickened. It's looking good, Jenna. I'll have to come over and have some apple pie later. Okay, so we saw that Jenna had started the water bath. Um, I just wanted to go over the steps really quick. She did a really good job of showing you. So first off, we're gonna fill it up with water and get it heating. And we'll put our um, jars right on in that water. You can either heat the jars in the water or you can keep them warm another way. If you're putting warm, like pie filling or um, fruits or hot pack fruits or whatever in those jars, then um, you won't need to worry about having the jars heated through. Just remember, we don't wanna put cold jars into hot water, right? Cause that makes glass crack. So um, we want to prepare our, recipe, prepare our recipe and fill the jars and then add the lids and the rings. Make sure that the, li the lip of your jar is clean before you put the lids on there and that the lids are clean, okay? I'll wash them in soapy water, make sure those are nice and clean and put them on the jar. And then we can place the jars on the counter rack and then lower it into the simmering water. And then make sure that the water level covers the jars by one to two inches. If it doesn't, then you're going to want to add some boiling water, right? Because the water's already boiling. If we put cold in there, we're gonna lose our boil, right? So that's something to think about. I just warm up extra in my microwave if I need to, and then pour it in. Once we get it um, all in the counter, we're about to a boil, we put the lid on the counter and then we wait for that counter to get up to a soft rolling boil where the boil is maintained. So sometimes when we look at a boil, we'll see a few bubbles coming up and down, but they're sporadic and they're not consistent. A soft rolling boil is going to be consistent, something that we can't stir down and it doesn't go away. If the water level falls during the boiling, during the processing time, you'll need to add more water without losing that boil. So you're gonna to wanna to add boiling water at the time if you need to. Make sure that the water stays one to two inches above the lid. This is really important. We don't want too much water, but we need some in order to help the lid seal. Then once that water is boiling and it's at a good sustained boil, then we can start the timer. Don't start it before when it's not really at a good boil, start it when it's at a good soft rolling boil. When the time is up, then you turn off the heat, remove the lid, let the steam start to dissipate and the water cool down, and then let the jars cool for at least five minutes before you try to take them out of the canner. If we try to disturb those jars before that five minutes, we can mess up the seal, all right? So we're just gonna leave them in the canner for five, 10 minutes and let them cool and get that seal started. Then you will carefully remove the jars to a rack, dry towel or a cutting board, and then let them naturally cool for 12 to 24 hours. Don't try to force cooling. Don't put them in a really cold area where like uh, air conditioners blowing on them. 
or a um, breeze coming in from a window, try to keep them in a place where they can cool down slowly and naturally. All right, so that's using a water bath canner. And in the water bath canner, we're using the conduction from the heat on the bottom that moves through the boiling water to transfer heat into the jars and do the same thing in the jars. If you think about it, when you take jars out of a canner, you can see boiling bubbles coming up and out of those bottles. So we're doing the same thing. We're heating the water, which is then heating the food in the jars that is making that conduction work. And we're getting the heat all the way through the jars so that we get all the bacteria. We can do that same thought process with steam. Steam canners or atmospheric canners are um, available. And what we do with these is you can see that there's a bottom area that we can fill with water and then there's a rack that has holes in it that allows the steam to come up and surround the jars and then move out of the canner. It's kind of the same process because we're using the steam to transfer heat to the jars, which will then move the conduction of heat through the jars. This can happen and it can be done successfully, but the problem with at these steam canners is that only certain high acid foods can be used for them for a couple of reasons. The water in these canners only will last usually about 45 minutes. So if you have a processing time that is longer than 40 to 45 minutes, it's not gonna work to process those foods. Remember, Jenna talked about using approved recipes. We need to make sure we use those approved recipes in those um, references that I cited earlier, and then any of the ball canning books in the USDA guide. And we need to use those processing times as they are written because those are what have been researched and we know that they are safe. So if there is um, a food that's requiring a higher amount of time for processing, a steam canner isn't going to work. Um, a couple other things to note for steam canners <clears throat> is that we do not ever want to lift the dome because then you're changing the temperature, right? If you lift the dome, all of a sudden all that steam escapes and we've cooled those jars. We've cooled the environment and the atmosphere around the jars and we need to start over. We start the processing over. So that means you can't add water during the processing time. If you don't have enough water in there and you lose your plume of steam during the processing, you're gonna fill it up and start over. I find these canners to be really difficult to work with. They make me a little nervous just because sometimes you can get it going and you're doing pretty good and then your steam falls and you have to start all over again. So I prefer water bath canning um, and these steam canners really only work for a few types of high acid foods. So they're not always that convenient to have as well. So um, can be used, but probably not the most efficient use of canning um, in these types of canners. Um, and remember, Anytime we're canning, we never want to force cooling because part of the processing time, the steps to processing food safely, is that the cooling takes time. And that's built into those recipes. So we need to let them cool on their own. This can be frustrating because sometimes we have so much canning to do and we don't want to wait for things to cool before we can move them. I would suggest that you use two water bath canners at a time if that's the case, but give them their time to cool naturally um, so that you don't lose your seals on your um, lids and that you are processing them safely. All right, so let's talk about lid seal. How do we know that the jars are sealed? Uh, most of us will just push down in the middle of the jar, right? To see if the button pops up and down. This is a problem though, because it can, cause a false seal. So if we push on that and then all of a sudden we hear the jar seal, we're like, oh, it's good, it's sealed. Those kind of seals are not are not recommended and they're not the best. So not the best plan to use the middle in case that we create a false seal. Uh, you can use a metal spoon and thump on the top. If it sounds kind of hollow, then it's good. It's like a dull sound. Then you know that that lid is sealed and it's good. Also, you should be able to see it with your eye. There's a little bit of concave that goes into the lid and you can tell if it's sealed or not. Um, once a jar is all the way sealed and I take the bands off, sometimes I'll lift them by the lid. After it's all the way cooled, I meant. <laughs> we've already cooled it, we've washed it. We're looking at the seal and if you lift it carefully by the lid, I usually do this over a towel or something just in case that lid isn't sealed all the way so I don't break a jar. You can also use that kind of gravity test to see if it's sealed completely. Why does that matter? And what happens if it isn't sealed, right? Um, that is a question I get all the time. My beans didn't seal, what do I do? And you know, it's so much work 
to go into can to do canning and to preserve that food and we want it for another for later in the year um, it's kind of like this really stressful thing if the lids don't seal uh, so what can we do if we have jar seals fail uh, there can be a couple reasons why this happens and we'll go into more details about that but it must be either immediately refrigerated or reprocessed and when it's reprocessed that means that we get new lids we check the we clean it up the rims of the jars and we start the processing time over again with new lids so it's not as simple as oh i can dunk them back in my water bath and then they're going to seal the second time no we need to put new lids on and reprocess but all within 24 hours okay so if you notice that it didn't seal you need to get it reprocessed within 24 hours or it needs to go in the refrigerator you can stick it in your freezer, put it in some Ziploc bags and freeze it, or you can have a good feast on whatever it was you were canning okay, and use that up in the next week or so. So it's not a complete loss. You can still enjoy it. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you guys saw it when the it's been thickened right before I put in the apple. So you can kind of see um, that it really has thickened quite a bit. Um, so I'm just going to pour in the apples. Um, let me grab them. So we'll pour in the apples and then I'm just going to fold them in and then um, heat up the apples. So and then uh, we'll come back. So back to you, April. OK, awesome. I love the look of clear gel and you can see where it gets its name because when it thickens, it's clear. Did you notice that? <laughs> So it has that really shiny, pretty color to it. So clear gel is kind of a fun one to play with sometimes. All right, so why didn't our lid seal? Okay, so sometimes the lid doesn't seal because we give the food in the jar an incorrect headspace. So looking at this jar, you can see a really large space from the lid to the start of the food or the liquid in this food. Uh, that is a huge headspace, right? <laughs> And this was caused because of siphoning. And we're going to talk about what siphoning is. But siphoning happens because of these reasons as well. And it's also because the lid, it can make it so the lid doesn't seal. Sometimes when we have a product like this and we are processing it, especially in a pressure canner, if we have um, a temperature drop really fast, then the water will come out of the jar. And when that happens, sometimes we can get particles of food that sit upon, up on the lid and it will cause it so the lid won't seal. So we want to avoid siphoning so that the lid can have every opportunity to seal. Uh, sometimes this can also happen because there are air bubbles that are in the food that we didn't remove properly. And Jenna's gonna show you how to do that. So I'm gonna let her do that, but we have to get those big air bubbles out and kind of make the food more um, consistent in the air that is distributed through the food so that we don't get those air bubbles that can get, cause problems with our lid. You can also get lid seal failures if it's not processed for the correct amount of time. If you're using damaged lids or jars, or so like if there's a chip in the top of the rim of the jar, or if your rings are dented or really rusted, they won't work correctly. So we need to make sure that we're using the best lids and rings that we can possibly get and our jars so we double check them and make sure there's no cracks or dings in that rim because that rim is really important to helping that lid seal uh, so those are some of the reasons that our lids will fail and some of the reasons that we have siphoning the biggest reason we have siphoning though is because of a change in temperature uh, so this could be if you're forcing the counter to cool too fast or if you lose pounds of pressure when you are pressure canning yeah, and Jenna, just let me know when you're ready to fill jars. So one thing to remember when we are preparing our fruit for canning is what we're putting in that jar is what we're going to eat, right? So we need to make sure that we're washing the fruit really good. We're taking out any bad spots that we have. You can peel and remove skins on your fruits according to your preference um, and the product you're making. So I peel peaches and tomatoes. Sometimes I won't peel apricots because I don't really mind the skin on the apricot when I um, cross can them. Um, and in like jams, 
Sometimes I don't peel apricots either. I do peel peaches though, because the peaches are a little too thick for my liking. But one way you can do this is really simple is you just plant kind of like Jenna showed you, get some boiling water, you put the whole fruit in there. So I'll just stick my tomatoes right in the boiling water, kind of stir them gently around so all of them are covered by the boiling water. Um, and then leave them in there for about 30 to 60 seconds. You'll see a lot of times a crack in the skin and you'll know, oh, we're good. Pull those out, stick them in some ice water and then the skin slip off quite easily. You can also use the pit core slicer that Jenna used if you're doing a lot of apples. Uh, I do recommend that. That works really fast when you're doing a lot of apples. And then like Jenna talked about, you can use a pre-treatment if you need to as you're process, you know, getting the apples ready for processing and use, you might want to keep them in um, a pre-treatment like water and lemon juice, or we're gonna talk about some other ones so that we can keep the skin, the flesh nice and white and avoid any browning from the reaction to the air and the enzymes in the apple. So a couple other things you can use um, lemon juice as you hold them. There are some other pre-treatments so lemon juice with, mixed with water is a good one. We have ascorbic acid that you can purchase. It comes in a powdered form that you can get at some circum supermarkets. You can also get it online through Amazon and different places like that. So the ratio of this is one teaspoon of powder to a gallon of water. It's a good treatment solution. Ascorbic acid though is vitamin C. All right, so they're the same thing. So you can get vitamin C tablets and crush and dissolve those as well and create a treatment solution as well. So sometimes that's a little bit cheaper option. And then there's also citric acid powder. Um, I used to use this a lot more years ago. It's a little harder for me to find, but I find it usually in the pharmacy section. It used to be quite inexpensive. The last few times I got it, it was a little more expensive. Uh, so just depending on what you would like to do, uh, this is the kind of pretreatment that you can get. Uh, I typically will use the lemon juice treatment the most because I can get it pretty cheap at Sam's Club and it, it, to me it's cheaper and easier to use than some of these others, but these also work well. So this gives you some options on how to pretreat. Generally, you can do this for lighter skin fruits before you pack and can them or if you're using them for a pipe filling that you would like to keep that flesh um, a little more pristine, or if you are processing lots of fruit at the same time so that it can, you can hold it in the pristine condition before you use it. So there are a couple ways that we pack foods into jars. Now, Jenna was showing you apple pie filling and she was heating first the sauce for the pie filling and now the apples. So that is what we call a hot pack is when we have heated the sauce or the liquid, okay? So it's not always a thickened liquid. Sometimes it's just like a sugar syrup or even water. Uh, we heat that and then we put the food in there with it and allow the food to get completely heated all the way through. This is a good way to can because what it does is it allows our food to retain its quality longer because it helps remove air bubbles from the food and equalize them. Um, into our liquid and into the, uh, the rest of the food that's there. It also allows for shrinkage of the food. So when you're putting it into the jars, it can be a little more loosely filled because you know that the food isn't gonna shrink during processing. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and then it keeps food floating and it prolongs the shelf life. So the jar itself looks prettier, okay? But it also prolongs the shelf life of the food and the food just has a better color and a better uh, texture over time. You can also raw pack. And so this is different than the hot pack where we're just going to prepare the fruit and put it right in the jar. And then we will pour a boiling liquid over that fruit uh, before we process it. Both of them are safe um, and there's pros and cons to both. Uh, but with raw pack, you notice in these jars, you can see how the food is floating to the top, right? And then we have our liquid concentrated at the bottom. It's less of a homogeneous distribution of that food in the jars. And we don't have quite as good color and texture as we do when we use a hot pack. But it is a little more convenient to do raw pack because you don't have to get you know, more pots dirty and you don't have to boil it. And sometimes it can be a little sticky when you do that. 
So there is some pros and cons to both, but for a better product and a more consistent product, hot pack will do that. Do um, one thing to note is when you are doing hot pack, um, it is best to pre prepare one batch at a time. So we, Jenna was talking about her recipe, <clears throat> excuse me. So she's going to prepare one recipe at a time and then fill her jars and start them processing before she starts another, excuse me one second. She's going to do that before she starts the next batch because she's only gonna be able to process so much at a time. And if we do like a double batch of the pie filling, we're going to have it sitting there while we process our other pie filling and it won't be as, the quality of that food will not be as high as the others, okay? And it will cool down and there's, we'll have to bring it back up to temperature before we put it in the bottles and then process it. So we can lose quality in that. So it's best to do one recipe at a time, fill your bottles, prepare them, put them in the water bath canner, get them going, and then start, and then start another one. Um, and here are some of the books that we use that have lots of recipes in them. You can also find these online, so the um, USDA guide or this home canning guide. You can find all of those recipes online. You can find a lot of the ball ones online, but this is the blue book. This is the Bible for canning. So I recommend this is a good starting point to get a ball blue book and then a USDA guide. These other two are also really good. They're all backed by research. The recipes have been studied. We know that they are safe. Um, they're just a little more advanced and have a little more, I uh, guess you get a little more fun with these recipes. So the first two are good starting out points and good basics of how to do different foods and the recipes that go with those. And then the other two are um, a little more spiced up, I guess you would say. <laughs> these are great, great resources. And we can't emphasize enough that we all need to be using approved recipes for our canning. Many of us may have um, grandmas and moms that have used recipes for a long time, but if they're not approved recipes, we don't know for sure that the, that food is going to be safe for us to eat. Um, so it is recommended that you get into these books and look at the approved recipe and you follow them exactly or as exactly as possible. All right. So that's the goal. We may not do it exactly, but if we get as close as possible, we're going to be safe. All right, so let's talk about lids for a minute. There is a trick to how we tighten the lids and it can change how the lids function and how they seal, not only when we first process them, but over time, okay? So you can get still fails. Like you, you can process your food, the stills look good, you wash them, you clean them, you store them, and the lids can fail. So it's important to check those lids every time you get another bottle out of your storage Make sure the lid is still good before you consume the food because they can fail. Um, if we, when we are tightening our lids, so you can see with this picture at the bottom, we have the metal flat disc lid that goes on right on top of the jar, the rim of the glass jar. And then you have your metal ring that goes on top of that. And I'm sure Jenna will show you this. The ring holds the flat disc lid in place while we're processing the food and gives the lid the chance to seal. If it's too tight, then the air can't escape and we will see a buckling in that lid. We will also see some food discoloration and sometimes jar breakage, all right? So we need to be careful that we finger tighten it, but not so hard that we're gonna have a hard time getting that off. We need to allow that lid some flexibility. If it's too lit, loose, then we're gonna have liquid that's gonna escape um, and then the seal will fail. Do not adjust, readjust the lids after processing. Remember, we're just going to leave them alone and let them do their thing and seal. Then we can take the rings off and clean them and store them. Uh, reusable lids are okay, but they would require um, a new ring, rubber ring seal. Um, these kind of lids are called the Tatler lids, uh, but they're not used as often. These um, disposable lids are more familiar for most people and more available. So I recommend those if you're just starting out. Um, and sometimes the reusable lids, the Tatler lids, don't have as much luck with them sealing consistently. Uh, I don't anyway. All right, so one of the things that we'll need to do, and I'm sure Jenna will show you this, is to remove air bubbles. The best thing to do is use a rubber spatula or a plastic type knife or tool, because you can buy tools that will for just for canning that help remove air bubbles. Avoid using a metal knife or spatula or spoon or anything like that because if we hit the jar just right, it can shatter the jar. 
or nick it and damage it. Make sure that you wipe down the rim of the glass jar so that nothing on that rim is interfering with the sealing of the lid. And then when they're cooled, your jars are cooled, I always take my rings off, I wash them really good, check the seals, dry them, and then put them away without the ring on them. Uh, the rings sometimes can get stuck on there, they can rust, they might hold uh, your flat in place and indicate a false seal. So it is safer to store your home canned foods without the ring. And I think it preserves the life of your rings for longer as well. I don't seem to have to throw them away as much if I don't store the jar with the ring. All right. Let me just adjust my camera. So we're looking at the canning station. So I've already filled a couple of jars, um, but I'm going to walk us through the process of um, putting our apple pie filling in the jar. Oh, sorry about that. So we can see that whole process. So I got a couple of different tools um, that we'll be using. So I took my, got a hot jar right here. Um, and then we've got our finished apple pie filling and it looks delicious. And so I'm just going to put uh, the funnel in the jar and this will just help with getting the apple pie filling into um, our jar. And then I just have a measuring cup that I'll use to scoop out, get this out of the way, apple pie filling. So we'll just fill it up. And this recipe um, asks us to leave one inch of headspace. So I'm gonna fill up about a cup, a little bit more than a cup in the jar, and then we'll see where we're at with our headspace. And then if we need a little bit more pie filling, after that, we'll put a little bit more in. The funnel is super nice, um, especially with this uh, pie filling. So it keeps things, it's easier to get all the, the pie filling in the jar. Okay, maybe a little bit more. We'll see where we're at. Um, we can always take food out if we're over that one inch of headspace. Okay, so I took out the funnel and I have this tool that I'll use to help us measure the headspace. It's kind of got a lot of apple pie filling on it. Um, let's see if, there we go. So you can see right here, it says one inch. And so we'll just put that at the top of our jar like that. And we want the food to come up to the base um, of this tool. So I'll put it on the top of the jar and it's actually just right about at the top or the base of that tool. So that was great. It helped that I did a couple of jars before we did this. Um, and then April talks about getting the air bubbles out. Um, and this is a super nice tool because you can just use the opposite in to get out any air bubbles. You don't want to cut up the apples. Um, too much, but you can just move the food around to get out those air bubbles um, in the jar. So we've got that going. I'll kind of um, get it flat again, and then we'll do some measurements. This apple pie filling is a little bit, actually might need a little bit more getting the um, air bubbles out of there. So I'm just going to put a little bit more in so the whole top of it is at that one inch headspace. Okay, let's re get the air bubbles out and then I'll check the headspace again. So that's looking better. Um, the one thing with the apple pie filling is it's kind of sticky. <laughs> um, but before we put on the lid, we want to make sure that we clean the top of our jar, especially with this sticky um, pie filling. Um, so I just have a paper towel that I'm going to come around the top of our jar and make sure that we get off any of that sticky apple pie filling. And you want to do this with any, whenever you're, whatever you're canning, you'll want to clean the top of your jar. Okay, so we've got that. 
And then I've cleaned the lids and the rings. So we'll just put that on top and then put the ring on and then we're good to go. Look at that lovely apple pie filling. Um, and then I'll just take you over to, so I'll, I'll put this jar in the water bath canner really quick. And then we've got our jars um, in the canner. I'm, I'm gonna lower the, the jars into the canner and then I'll start, I'll turn it up to high so we can get a, a boiling water bath or a boiling water going. And then I won't start the processing time until I see that rolling boil. So that'll take a couple of minutes. So I'll hand it back over to April. And then once it's boiling, we'll show you what that looks like. So my grandma taught me that once you wash the tops of the jars with your rag and you clean it off, then you always run your finger around the rim because sometimes you can fill nicks and cracks more than you can see them. And so I was always taught to wash, dry, run your finger around so that you can tell that there is, if there's a chip or not, so that you don't lose that, that bottle. All right, so when we're packing fruits, much like Jenna did with the apple pie filling is she used a really a thicker syrup, right? But we use some kind of a syrup in our foods for a few reasons. People like the flavor, right? Sugar makes things better, but also, um, the syrup and the sugar level can help retain the color and shape and texture of the food. Uh, it doesn't really matter for spoilage. You know, a long time I thought it was the sugar that preserved the food, but that isn't the case. It's the processing that kills the bacteria that preserves the food. The syrups do another job. Uh, so it really doesn't matter how thick or light a syrup it is. It depends on your preference and the type of product that you're trying to make. So a lot of people are going for a very new light syrup, which is much like the natural sugar content of the fruit. And that's what I do. I do a very light syrup in mine. My kids definitely like other people's peaches better than mine because they use a heavier syrup. <laughs> um, but I like mine to have a lighter syrup in them. Uh, you can use sugar. Uh, and this chart at the bottom shows you how you can make the different uh, types of syrup how much sugar to water really is what it is. So the very light is only about 10% sugar to water where the heavy is like 40% sugar to water. And usually we only use the heavy syrups for really tart things like tart apples or cherries to kind of mask the, that bitter that comes with the tart. Uh, but it's up to you, it's a preference thing. Uh, so try a few recipes, try a few different kinds and see what you like. Just remember you can use uh, corn syrup, if you would like for a different kind of flavor or texture in that, just because corn syrup does have a little bit of a different, um, mostly flavor than table sugar. And then honey can also be used to replace up to half of the table sugar in the syrup. So use corn starch, corn syrup, or honey for half the table sugar in these syrups. Just a note on honey that it is not recommended for younger children. It can carry botulism and so in small amounts. And so it's not a good idea to use honey if you're gonna be feeding this to younger children. I personally just use table sugar. It's cheaper than corn syrup and it, it works just as well. So what happens when we use less sugar? Why is that a problem? It's not really a problem. It can just kind of change the firmness of the fruit uh, and the texture over time. But if you're using a fully ripe firm fruit, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference in the fruit you're using. And I, you know, you just get used to it. We've gotten used to less and less sugar over time and it, they taste fine to me. It's still, I always love to can peaches and pears because to me, it tastes like summer in February. And so it still tastes like that to me. And so it doesn't make a huge difference on the, the type of um, amount of sweetening. It can just, you know, change the calories in that and, you know, make it a different type of product for your diet. You can also, canned fruit in its own juices. So you could buy like canned apple juice and use that to can your fruit in. If you choose, uh, you can use blends of unsweetened juices to do that. Uh, you can make your own juice if you have apples and you wanted to juice some apples and then can apples in that. 
Uh, you can follow the processing recommendations for fruits and sugar syrups in the books that we referenced. And then be aware, sugar substitutes are not a good idea for canning fruit just because we get them to such a high temperature in our water bath that those sugar substitutes tend to go bitter when they're heated and they don't, they're not as stable over time. So sugar substitutes are not recommended for canning fruits. As Jenna was showing you that pie fillings are excellent products, they're fun and it is so awesome to have those in your storage <clears throat> when you're ready to make a pie. It's like, oh, it's all done because one quart of apples or any other kind of pie filling will make an eight inch pie. So very convenient, work's all done, can just throw it in and go. And like Jenna said, it is recommended that we use clear gel. That is the best one to be used for pie fillings uh, for a couple of reasons. Sometimes people are frustrated because it's difficult to find, but with online shopping, it's much easier to find clear gel. The other thickeners are not recommended for canning because they just don't have the same kind of stability uh, in the canning process and then holding the food over time. So cornstarch is not shelf staple and it doesn't produce a clear gel, it's more cloudy. Clear gel, like you saw, had, was a nice, pretty clear gel and it was shiny, so it's great. The University of Nebraska does have a few recipes that use tapioca um, for safe pie filling recipes, but that's about all we found there. And then flour does not hold up and there are not recommended recipes to use flour as a pie filling, okay? You can do it for freezer, but not for water bath canned. All right, so we're just going to talk a minute. We'll move from fruits and packing those to jabs and jellies. We're just going to go over this pretty quick because we're getting closer to our time. So I just thought I would define these for you really quick. Jellies are usually made by cooking or freezing fruit juice with sugar. So they're clear. They don't have bits of fruit in them. They don't have seeds. They're just juice and pectins and sugar. Jams are usually made by cooking or freezing chopped fruit and adding sugar or pectin to them as you desire. Um, jams are less firm than jellies. That is how they're supposed to be. So if we do it correctly, jellies are gonna hold up on their own. Jams are gonna be a little softer. Reserves have small uniform pieces of uh, fruit in a thick sugar syrup. So they're kind of slightly gelled, but they're not like a jam. So it's more fruit bits than it is jams that will hold up on a piece of bread. You can have them on bread. They're just a little more runny and the runny side. Conserves are like jams, but they have added ingredients, coconut, nuts, and raisins, and they can sometimes use a multiple fruits in them. Marmalades are usually fruits that have like a citrus peel, and the citrus peel is distributed evenly through that marmalade and or through that product, and they are softer fruit jelly. Okay, so usually citrus is what we use for marmalades. Uh, fruit, fruit butters use more of the fruit, and they mash that fruit and add some spices and cook them till they're thickened. So it's like a spreadable, spreadable consistency, like an apple butter, if you've ever had that. And then syrups are made from fruit juices and sugar, and they're usually boiled until they're a pourable consistency. I have done a few syrups that use a pectin, but not very much pectin, just thickens it a little bit. All right, so when we're making jams, there are three really key critical ingredients. If <laughs> you can't really make jams and jellies, <laughs> without these three things. So you have fruit, you have an acid, typically lemon juice, and then sugar. Now, if you have those three things, you can make a jam with those or a jelly by just, well, these jams, I think, make their own pectin. And so you can boil them for a really long time and you can get a gel, <laughs> but it takes a really long time. Some fruits are a little uh, better at creating their, uh, higher concentration of pectin. So uh, strawberries, I've done it with strawberries before where you just cook it, cook it, cook it, cook it, and it will make its own gel so by concentrating that pectin. Um, but most of us will use a box pectin or a, pro a pectin product to help us kind of accelerate that uh, process of making a jam. The acid is actually really necessary to help a gel form. Uh, if we don't have acid in there, then the gel and the molecular structure of that gel won't form correctly. So acid is a key ingredient. Uh, I remember when I was first making jam, I didn't have enough. I didn't have any lemon juice. So I'm like, ah, it doesn't matter. So I made my first batch and it did not gel. 
<laughs> I was trying to figure out why, because the acid plays a key role in that molecular structure to make a gel. And these are the pectins I was referring to. Most of us use the box pectins or the liquid pectins. This just speeds up the gelling of that product. Plus, in my opinion, it makes a better and more consistent product for jams and jellies. When trying to make a jam or a jelly by boiling it and allowing the pectin to concentrate, sometimes you take it off too soon and you don't quite get that gel that you're looking for. I feel like with boxed ones and the liquid pectins, you just get a more consistent product more often. Just one thing to note, uh, the two on this side are liquid pectins. And then the ones on the left, on my left anyway, the boxes in the little green round container, those are powdered pectins. Both work really well, but they are not interchangeable. Follow the recipes that are in the boxes, okay? I always use those recipes. Trying to do a sure gel recipe with MCP pectin doesn't work. It just doesn't. So use the recipes within these um, pectins for you to get the product that you're looking for. You really can't cut pectin. You can't uh, change the recipe because if you do that, you change ratios and you just, you can't mess with science. You can't mess with how that gel structure is forming. And so these have been tested. They know they work. So follow it as exactly as possible. If it says four and a half cups of fruit, it needs to be four and a half cups of fruit. Um, I know sometimes it's tempting to be like, oh, I'll just push it to five and a half or six. You won't get the same kind of gel if you don't follow the recipe of the exactness. So what does the sugar do? Well, it does a couple of things in a gel. Remember how we talked that it's more flavor and texture for the fruits? In a gel, it actually does some of the important work to help bind the water to keep it a gel, but it also sweetens it. It changes the viscosity. So that's the pourable texture of that food um, and it binds water. So that's one of the reasons that we have sugar in food, like jellies, because it binds the water and it helps keep the gel information instead of becoming more runny. So sugar is important. Uh, if we don't, if we have too much, we can cause problems with how strong the gel is or how too little, how weak the gel is. And we can get what we call weeping. So water will start to pull, pull out of the gel. I don't know if you've ever seen that, you've opened like a, a jar of um, jam and there'll be like a little bit of juice on top just because it's had a stronger gel then the water could um, stand and so it comes off. So usually you can stir it in, but it creates not as firm a gel. So depending on what you want and the quality of product you're looking for, um, the amount of sugar can change that. So what do we need to make jam? A lot of the same things Jenna was using to do the pie filling. You just need a water bath canner, jars and lids. You need spoons to stir things and make sure that that pectin gets dissolved, your headspace tool and getting the bubbles out. And then right here on the right is a sieve. Those are really good if you're trying to make a jelly or you want to reduce the seeds in your jam. So if you're doing like a boysenberry, they have a lot of seeds and you just don't want as many seeds in your jelly or your jam, you can run them through a sieve and get out some of the seeds or even bits of fruit if you don't want that. If you're trying to make a clear jelly, you definitely want a sieve and a fine sieve will help you with that. All right, so why do we process jelly products? Um, they really aren't super dangerous because so much of the sugar in the gel binds the water and without water, bacteria can't grow very well. But there are a few molds that can grow in jams and jellies. So when we process them, we kill those spores that can cause the molds and we preserve the shelf life of our food. It used to be thought, people thought you could just scrape this mold off and go on with life and you were good. That is not the case. We're finding that that mold is causing more trouble than we thought. So we want to keep our food safe and we want to avoid spoilage so, and increase the shelf life of that food. So we need to process the jam and jellies at, that will be at, stored at room temperature according to the recipe directions. And there are some in the books that we referenced but it's also really best to just look at what is on the pectin and use that as your guide. Now, if you're doing freezer jams, different story. Those do not have to be water bath camped. Just follow the directions and those go straight into the freezer. But if we're going to put them in jars with lids and store them at room temperature, they need to go through processing. So that was very fast for the jams and jellies, but it really is, when I tell people, they ask, where do I start canning? I tell them, start with the jam, get the pectin, go through that, try a jam. 
um, and then try a fruit because it's a really great place to start and can do smaller batches in the beginning and, and just kind of get used to that kind of canning and then progress into other things. Review really fast. Remember, use high quality foods, quality in, it's quality out, and it's what you're going to get, okay? You can't put in poor quality food and get good out of it. It just doesn't work that way. Make sure they're free of diseases and bruises because what's on the food is going to go in your jars and you're going to eat it. Uh, use the hot pack method. It is the recommended method so that you'll have the best quality for of food. Uh, prevent darkening by using some kind of pretreatment while you're working with your food and also as the food sits over time, it can help with that quality and the color of the food. Fill the jars while food is still hot, okay? And the jars are warm, right? That also helps with getting things ready to process and getting things going well. And then be aware of the correct headspace. Jenna showed you how to do that. It's critical. If we don't have the right headspace, you will have problems. I remember one year I had all these apples that my neighbor had given me and we boiled them and we put them through a Petrolo strainer and made this wonderful applesauce. And I did not put enough headspace for the applesauce and none of my lids sealed. <laughs> so we had a lot of applesauce <laughs> for a week, week and a half. And it was kind of sad because it's a lot of work to do applesauce. So just know the headspace matters. Be careful how you tighten the screw bands. Not as, you don't want to tighten them all the way down. Don't screw them down way, way far. Just finger tight, make sure they're snug but not overly tight. And then process and cool your jars carefully so that those lids will, will seal. Follow recipes exactly for jams and jellies. Don't exchange liquid pectin for powder pectin. I've actually done that and it does not work. <laughs> it really doesn't work. <laughs> um, I ended up with some really funny looking products. So don't do that. Um, take it from my experience. Then remember to store your jars in a cool, dark place that stays about 50 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit all year. So somewhere that it's not going to get a lot of light that's going to change and oxidize your product. And then can no more food than you can use within a year. The recommendations on those lids, they are only guaranteed for one year. So the recommendation is you need to use all home canned food within a year of um, processing it. 